You are all very welcome to this EBA seminar, arranged by the expert group for AIDS studies. We are very pleased to see so many of you here today. It's, uh, we are running up to Christmas, so it's, uh, I think it's, I was a bit afraid that it's too late before Christmas to have a seminar, but, but I was wrong, and I'm happy about that. My name is Gunbrit Andersson, and I'm here today in my capacity as a member of the EBA, of the expert group, but also I share the reference group for this study. So I've read it many times <laughs> in order to understand it. I hope I understand it now. The expert group for AIDS studies is a government committee set up to contribute to the improvement of Sweden's development cooperation. In, co in co uh, uh, collaboration with researchers and other experts, we analyze and evaluate Swedish international development systems. We focus primarily, par primarily on over overarching issues within Swedish development assistance, not on individual projects. EBA defines independently the issues to be examined and the studies to be commissioned. Authors are solely responsible for an analysis and recommendations. This seminar will be live streamed on EBA's web page and can also be seen there afterwards. Uh, and and uh, I have my own also introduction. And I hope that we will have an interesting uh, afternoon uh, looking closer at ownership as a key quality of development cooperation that deliver sustainability and better living conditions for poor people and countries. Uh, EBA is proud of having commissioned this study of a principle that has been constantly subscribed to in policy document over the years. In Swedish, for sure, but also in international development debate. But what about implementation? The principles are mostly seen in relation to donors and recipients, being donor countries and recipient countries. State-to-state -state cooperation has been the core point of reference. For sure, that was so when the Paris Declaration was agreed upon in 2005. In later e meetings, new elements have been added, but I feel it is fair to note that the understanding of ownership and its implementations, implications uh, for aid effectiveness has become more diffuse. No wonder. The world of development cooperation has changed fundamentally, something that probably had started in the beginning also of this millennium. Or our or the general perception of what development aid is about have not followed suit, and thus not either how to apply principles like ownership. The report before us is, long, is a long and thorough investigation. It reveals how, if you read it carefully, how actors, stakeholders and also vested interests have become more numerous, both on the donor and recipient side. Uh, the goals themselves of development cooperation have, all, have also evolved, evolved. In the new uh, sustainable development goals, there are many more than, for instance, Sweden had made explicit in our programs before. They apply to development aid, but also to other areas of public policy and also to the private sector. In the, the sustainable development goals, richer and poorer countries are supposed to be more equal partners. Are they in reality? The multilateral system, including more and more vertical programs, have prominent roles in implementing the, the new development agenda. Oh, how, oh, how, who owns them and who owns their interventions and products. I will not say more now, uh, but only say to you that we have a very strong panel that I will introduce later, uh, but now give the floor to two of the authors. Uh, we have, have we all of them here, all the authors here? No, three, three of them, three of them. And, 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 and we have the one that has been sort of the leader of the team, but, but it, it, back, backstopping it, that's uh, Stefan Klingebiel. <laughs> from the uh, uh, German Institute for uh, uh, Development Policy. And then it's Nils Kaiser, who we have seen at several occasions in our, in our reference group meetings and at, at, at uh, presentations of the report, for instance, seminar in, 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 in uh, Gothenburg. And also Charlotte Örnemark, uh, who is a, a Swede. She has been able to read the Swedish documents, and, and, but she is a consultant in Washington. And I give the floor to you now for the presentation of the report. 
Thank you. So, have you got your? Yeah, I've got it here. Yeah, good. So, this might need to be a bit higher. Uh, yeah. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I remember in, in, in June this year, we had a meeting of the reference group and we were presenting our first findings and discussing next steps. Um, and I remember us discussing that uh, it would be great if we would publish this report in the second half of this year, because there were elections in September, so there would be a new government in office, um, and it would be the perfect timing for this report. So I think that, that um, suggests to you that we are optimistic people. So we are a group of four optimistic researchers who uh, wrote a 200-something page report uh, on ownership, which we can't possibly summarize to you, so we will just present some highlights to you. Uh, you can take it home for Christmas if you read an average of 14 uh, pages per day. You should be done by New Year's Eve. Um, so then, uh, just to talk you into the subject, it, it's been almost uh, 50 years, half a century, since the Pearson report um, on partners in development was, was published, which brought us the 0.7% target, which we will achieve in 2030, but also triggered this, this first um, uh, discussion on ownership and participation in development policy. It was also the time when the, when the first, uh, first ever Swedish policies on development uh, were written, on, on typewriters probably. Um, and then also there, it was indeed um, getting a strong focus and the idea was that ownership could help navigate this tension between new countries that had just become independent but needed external support to become even more independent and more sovereign. That was a difficult uh, balancing act at the time. Um, and then we went into decades that were of, of, of different nature, uh, trial and error, um, more attention to imposing our views and more attention to listening that was kind of going up and down. Um, we did have between 2005 and 2008 a strong focus on aid effectiveness. It was a time when, when aid budgets were increasing, when countries were interested in being compared to one another. Um, but this whole idea and this peer pressure evaporated with the start of the financial crisis. And we now have a more kind of, we still have international processes, but we talk about good practices, and, but we don't really compare one another as much anymore. There's no more of this peer pressure to, to help uh, the collective effectiveness grow over time. Um, so that's the starting point of our study. We've done the study to find out to what extent um, ownership is still a relevant principle or concept in development cooperation today? And if so, then, then uh, what might it mean today? We've done an analysis of an international trend. Um, we looked into Swedish cooperation policies. Specifically, of course, we conducted three case studies. And it's a qualitative study. So we've mainly relied on doing interviews, um, getting people's perceptions. Um, and, and it was very detailed. So we even met several people more than once. And we, and we tried to figure out what is, what is meant by this and what people understand with ownership. Um, so then, if we look at these trends, we see uh, um, a consensus development agenda, but one which is very large, I would say. It's, it's almost an all-encompassing um, agenda with uh, loads of goals, targets, and indicators, but also a wide variety of actors that, that are supposed to, to do something with the agenda. And it's difficult to get consensus on something this big. And also, you have uh, yeah, an increase in the, in the number of potential owners, um, but also we go from a setting where we were mainly preoccupied with common problems, so there were problems that all countries faced themselves individually, and there were external partners helping them, to collective problems that countries can only solve when they work together. Uh, that requires different ways of working, but also it, it, it makes the ownership challenge differently. Um, there's also no consensus on how to implement this new agenda. So there are people thinking that it's about leaving the one behind. Um, there are others thinking that it's actually about leaving them behind by, by, by supporting border management in other parts of the world. Um, so there are, there are lots of conflicting interpretations made of the new agenda that still have to be uh, reconciled at this point in time. Um, we're moving away from this more government-to-government -government type of cooperation. Um, I'll, I'll point to that in a, in a minute. There's a growing discrepancy between what the general public thinks is being done in development cooperation and what is actually being done. 
Um, and linked to that also, there uh, are several OECD members, uh, Sweden not, not yet one of them, um, who are um, formally saying that they, that they pursue mutual interests with their development policies. So it should be good for them, but simultaneously it should also be good for us. Um, the good for us bit is still difficult to, uh, to evaluate, but it's also understandable why people shy away from that. Um, what we see in our study is that we are moving away from this type of more direct cooperation that you see in the top left corner between an external partner um, and public authorities in, 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 uh, in developing countries. And we go towards a much more intermediated type of cooperation where you have lots of actors in between this, this, this government external partner relationship and you have people who are subcontracting and sub subcontracting um, and once you get so many different actors involved, directly as well as indirectly, it becomes much more difficult to determine whose ownership is concerned here, um, which agenda should be, should be followed, um, and so forth. So then when we get to that concept of ownership, um, it's a vague concept, it's, it's difficult to define. Um, there are also lots of critical perspectives in the literature that um, associate uh, uh, ownership to an act of mind control by the, uh, by the donor, whereby the, the partner is somehow exactly saying what the donor wants the partner to say. Um, and also we see, we see a bit of, uh, of a difference between the policy sphere that is mainly seeing um, ownership as something expressed on paper and a commitment, something in, in a document, in a strategy, and the academic research that is emphasizing rather who has control over the relationship. Um, we see rather in our study that, that ownership is not a binary condition, it's not on or off, um, but rather that it is a, a relational element and that it relates both to these commitments um, as well as to the, to the substance of cooperation. Um, and then ultimately also ownership both promotes and reflects the quality of development cooperation relationships. That's in a nutshell what we, uh, what we are looking into. And of course also, it is a principle, people are pursuing it, but they have to do many other things that are also priorities, and these might bite with one another. Um, there's a big section in our, in our report on trust, but we have 20 minutes. I encourage you to read that in the report. But basically, uh, by having this understanding of, of ownership, we um, found a lot of the literature on trust to be very helpful in terms of understanding how that would occur and how it would be shaped in these development cooperation relationships. Which brings me to uh, chapter four of the report about Sweden, which is where Charlotte then will take over. Thanks, Niels. Huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> so as Niels mentioned, we, um, we were taking a historical perspective of ownership in, um, in Swedish development cooperation. Um, and uh, from that point of view, it's clear that ownership has always been, and still is, both a found foundation and a cornerstone um, in Swedish developed co cooperation since its inception and to this day. And this is despite some swings, some pendular swings that have been going on, uh, both in Sweden and internationally, and that it's got a quite cyclical nature. But importantly for Swedish development cooperation is that uh, the fact that it is enshrined very clearly in the policy for global development, the PGD or PGU in Swedish, which was adopted by parliament in 2003 as a broad-based agreement across political parties. And in this way, it can be seen as some sort of unifying principle underlying development cooperation, but also value and an operative principle. That's why I thought it was important to just use this extract from the PGU which says, um, among other things, of course, that development can never be externally created or imposed on people. Development is created by people in their own society. We must therefore be become better at listening, but also better at making demands. So already here we can see how ownership is conceptualized, a conceptualization which goes beyond the state-to-state -state ownership definitions um, and ownership of development itself. And it takes us much more into this relational domain of solidarity between people and using the global international framework, the normative framework, to make such demands and hold uh, governments accountable. It's also important to point out that it has a very clear human rights-based principle and perspective, um, that it, this is put very centrally in the policy. Um, but then how do you put this into action? We looked at three recent, more recent challenges. Um, 
The first one related to a combination of reorganization, the role of intermediaries, and results-based management. Um, first was the introduction of centrally managed uh, global uh, strategies, which followed immediately after the reorganization of CEDA, and this, reduced in, um, this, this resulted in reduced headquarters staff at CEDA. There was, at the time when there was this felt focus in CEDA, so more and more people were um, put in, in the embassies at the field, while at the same time we had to cope with these new, quite large, uh, largely funded um, global strategies. So it increased the reliance on intermediaries for building and, and maintaining development cooperation relations. Another factor was the strong push um, at the time for results-based management combined with ongoing, already ongoing, new public management reforms, which meant that rather than having a reinforced focus on RBM to inform learning and building adaptive capacity for a more streamlined delivery, it led to certain fragmentation, silofication between units, and a largely outsourced knowledge base that previously existed in-house. Secondly is the considerable disbursement pressure that occurred uh, as human resource budget had not been increased proportionally to the ODA. This has led to more funding being channeled via international financial institutions, multilaterals and other international organizations, both via these multilateral channels and what's called multi-buy channels. A positive consequence is that Sweden may have more say then in multilateral fora where it is heavily invested, um, especially given that there was an effort, especially recently, to have a more coherent government response. But uh, there are also some questions on how to really promote um, ownership with such uh, governance, institute, governance fora in international organizations, and, and how do you do that as a, as a bilateral agency. Thirdly was the introduction of uh, loans uh, and blended finance using ADA, ODA to trigger SDG-aligned investment. And this can be seen as new and positive trend from an ownership perspe perspective as it requires a clear government commitment. However, for it to lead to more broadly, and we talked to this, this was for all people, all people's ownership, for it to lead to this more broadly anchored societal ownership, it then needs to be coupled with more efforts such as civic monitoring, social accountability initiatives, rights-based movement strengthening, so that citizens themselves can actually also increasingly get involved, monitor and own such broader sector reforms. Complementing the cases, the country cases, we did uh, Liberia and Rwanda, and Stefan who was there in both, and Niels will talk about that more later. We also looked a little bit more at one particular global strategy, which was the uh, strategy for sustainable development and climate change. Again, it has a longer name in Swedish, but... <clears throat> and it's so important to first of all point out that the introduction of these global strategies enables Swedish government to increase ODA lo allocation to a number of specific themes, including sustainable development and climate change. It's well resourced, as you can see, for the last strategy, which was approved in 2018, it has 6.5 billion over the next five years. So just some, I'll just kind of dump straight to some key findings from that. Um, and these are very indicative of what we already highlighted. The, the disbursement pressure leads to extended use of multilaterals, global funds, and international NGOs and think tanks with, with high absorption capacity by default. Um, and, and it's using mostly core funding modality. <clears throat> But how does this really then affect the local groups and frontline funding? Secondly, funding is typically given as core funding, as I said. Um, and, and it's sort of, this is assumed to then lead to higher relevance, I mean, to, to high level of ownership because it's core funded. But there are also free riding concern, since many others are doing earmarked funding. And there is no real shift away from productized cooperation on a global scale. Furthermore, think, more thinking is also needed on how ownership is perceived and used in relation to global public goods, like the environment, where ownership necessarily needs to transcend individual state boundaries. So finally then, on um, some reflections on um, ownership in Swedish development cooperation going forward, I think discussions on the future of development cooperation all too easily misinterpreted as a process that can be technically managed, leveraged, or otherwise directly controlled 
by development provider, only then to be assessed, legitimized, and des by the designated development recipients. And I think when we looked at this, the, the study is somewhat challenges that binary uh, perspective. If discussions would instead start from the realization that development cooperation is a relationship and that the strength, including the quality and equality of that relationship, um, that, that that is what determines its results, then the next challenge is how to better understand and improve that relationship, and you know, including the political dialogue, the multi-stakeholder problem solving, and using and contributing to global normative framework along the lines of SDGs. So in conclusion, I think looking back at this historic perspective, we have moved really from uh, development, doing development as a, as a gift almost, as a you know, self for self, self help is where we started, um, where ownership was somehow expected or assumed. Um, um, to also, we've also tried to move away, I think now from, from doing development to a designated country, to a particular target group, where ownership is almost imposed or um, used to legitimize the predetermined action. And hopefully we have moved into a third phase, uh, which le needs, leads to new forms of equal partnerships, more equal partnerships, for doing development with these new partners at multi-level and across multiple parties, where ownership, as well as risk, is more shared even though this might fluctuate, of course, the ownership and risk sharing might fluctuate in a highly inter interdependent system. So what we, why we talk about this more endogenous or balanced ownership is, that, is, is the sort of type of ownership where, which naturally merges between partners engaged in joint problem solving. So we have to make sure that that's where we're heading towards. And that means that uh, such ownership can hold multiple partners mutually accountable, not just for effective delivery, but also accountable for the learning from the delivery process itself, while upholding these rights-based principles that resonate with a broader civic constituency base. <clears throat> However, then going back to the first quote from the PTU, uh, such, um, such partnerships also need to include new and innovative ways of investing in all actors, including people themselves and those who represent them at the front line. And this is somewhat contrary though to the existing trends of centralizing funding due to efficiency arguments and to capacity constraints. I'll leave it there. So just 80 pages left to go. <laughs> um, so briefly on the two case studies, we, we looked at uh, Liberia and Rwanda, uh, which are both post-conflict states. And both have been very successful, uh, basically, after the turn of the millennium in, in using their recent history to mobilize international support and also repair relations with the international community, you could say. Um, also, at different points in time, they've been very much drivers of the aid effectiveness agenda. It wouldn't have gone so far between 2005 and 2008 if countries like Rwanda and Liberia hadn't really um, invested in this whole agenda at the top level and had their prime ministers speaking at uh, different fora and so on. Um, and then in both countries also, Sweden has chosen to, to work around government rather than directly with government. So that's also interesting. You can read the report as to what motivated those choices. I uh, won't go into that now, but um, um, in both countries you could say that, that, the, that the relations with the external partners are problematic, but in both cases in very different ways. Um, and also that there's, of course, a continued aid dependence. So both countries also prioritize uh, individual relations of, over collective effectiveness, and the donors have the same inclination. So that has led to an increased bilateralization of the cooperation relations. People still go to their donor group meetings, and they, and they sit and talk about how things are going in the sector, but, but then once the meeting is over, everybody tries to reinforce these bilateral relationships up to the point that in Rwanda you could really kind of see that, that donors were competing over access to government, access to information. Um, if you see also in Rwanda, um, speaking to government representatives, uh, there was a very strong focus on, on, on government ownership and, and government was of the view that um, uh, you might need multi-stakeholder ownership in those contexts where, where government is not clear or where government is not fully in control, but in their case there was no need to, to substitute for low leadership on the part of government by involving civil society. There was one plan in Rwanda, everybody was behind it, so 
um, that should work. Whereas in Liberia, it was rather the, the, the other uh, uh, extreme where, where, whereby at least some external partners had the idea that they felt more responsible for national development in Liberia than the public authorities of Liberia. Um, and also, that creates the old types of visibility concerns. So citizens on the radio um, are, are, are heard saying, well, if the World Bank or the European Union can, can, can build these roads, then, then, then what do we need a government for? Um, so it's, it's a rather, it, it's a difficult relationship um, and we have got some interesting details on in that. But to jump forward to the chapter where we uh, uh, combine our different findings, put them uh, next to each other, um, on the slide you see various words that, that, that often uh, feature in our, in, in our debates on the future of development policy. And sometimes um, these debates, they, they, they frame these as representing kind of absolute choices, like you either go for accountability or you go for learning, um, or you go for control or you go for trust. Um, so if you're in a relationship um, and you do not like uh, the, way it is, um, the way it is evolving and, and in your control over that relationship, um, then you could, for instance, leave the European Union, um, but it might, it might not, not improve your relationship that much. So, so rather in reality, you have to make do with what you have, with the partners that you work with, and you have to somehow find that optimal balance in that relationship. So that means that ownership will continue to be, to be hard to define, even after this study, um, but rather that you will need a very context-specific interpretation of what ownership is sought. And that maybe, for instance, in Rwanda, you might not need as much emphasis on control in that relationship as you might need in Liberia, but at the same time in Rwanda, you will need a much stronger uh, emphasis on inclusion rather than in Liberia. So this type of mix would then lead to that type of ideal balanced ownership in that particular relationship. Um, then jumping to the conclusions, um, and that comes from this previous slide, we, we, we find that ownership can only be meaningfully promoted when this balance is, um, is explicitly sought, and if people uh, uh, make this weighing uh, uh, yeah, among those involved and then find this, this balance that is needed. Um, and also that, that it is best promoted as part of a discussion on how to do development most effectively, rather than as some type of self-standing uh, um, policy on ownership or, or, or something that you would, you would promote irrespective of what other policy priorities uh, are pursued. It needs a holistic approach. Uh, we then have seven recommendations that we, we, we might touch upon at the panel as well or, or otherwise, but it basically comes also from the ob observation that Sweden is one of the remaining countries in the world, I would say, that is interested in this development effectiveness debate. It is surrounded by other members of the OECD that are no longer as interested and were rather showing um, adverse tendencies whereby they say, well, at this point in time, we can, we can look our partners at eye level and we can also determine our own interest in cooperation, which has been uh, yeah, leading to some more imposition um, in, in development cooperation uh, as of recent. So that means that Sweden is more isolated now with its agenda than it was 10 years ago. So that needs to be tackled. Um, it needs to be uh, uh, tackled by building new coalitions, like-minded perhaps. Uh, we also name drop Nordic Plus in the report. Maybe that's also a possible avenue to take. So that, that's one line of our recommendations. And the other is what needs to be done inside Sweden. Um, it needs to be a management of expectations. Uh, Swedish cooperation takes many different forms and maybe you can't have the same type of ownership ambition in all these different forms because you don't have the same amount of involvement, I would say, in the, in the cooperation relationships. Um, and then finally also, um, there needs to be a clear readjustment of the incentives inside the system. Is everybody equally aware that, that, that ownership is important? Um, if you work, say, in the, in the multilateral units, or if you work with civil society, or is it a bit more uh, natural for, for some parts of the system than for others? You have to cater to that um, and, and question whether that's the case. And then also, uh, um, yeah, you need to consider whether the human resources, as currently divided, are fit for purpose to that, uh, to that objective. That's the end. Thank you.
thank you, Nils and Charlotta. I hope it was, it was very clear and, and it will help you reading the report. You got it only today, but I hope this is very good. Now, uh, we will have a panel discussion. And, and I will invite uh, to the table here, first, uh, 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 Stefan Klingebil, who has been part of, this, uh, part of the team all the time during this study. He's head of the Multilateral Development Corporation at the Journal uh, Development Institute. I think we've been working with you before also <laughs> in EBA. And then uh, uh, Johanna, Thank you from the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, who have been very active, I think, in, in the Swedish government system, in, in, from the ministry, in international, in an international discussions on aid effectiveness, and also have a long experience from development cooperation, from, among other places in Bolivia, where you started as a J, JPO, and, has, and I think that's a good start uh, for a career in, in development cooperation. And, and then Karin Metal. Eva from SIDA, struggling with how to promote capacity building and ownership every day as head of the capacity development unit in, in, uh, in, and partnership in SIDA. You have a key role in, in, in all this. Hmm. And then we have, have, uh, have uh, I'll turn the page, we have also Georg Andrén, uh, who, who has yeah, he has he has many he has a lot different experiences. He has been have, have had high positions in the public sector and in the field and at, at the ministry and at SIDA, dealing with development cooperation. And now he is the what's the title Secretary General of Diakonia, the Swedish Oxfam. Or would you say so? Swedish Oxfam is a good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. I think you are, you are one of the prominent Swedish uh, international civil society development organizations. And then Len Lennart Volgemot, the Nestor of ownership <laughs> and, and, and capacity building. And, and, and he has been, yeah, you have, I, I will not count the years when you have been in this business, uh, but, but uh, uh, it's, it's very long. Uh, and in, in fact, I think you, you started with IMF in Tanzania after your studies in the 1970s, almost, yeah, <laughs> 60s, no, 70s, 70s it was, yes, and then you have been all around. Uh, I hope we will have a lively discussion, and, and in fact, Dior, you took my share. Huh? No, <laughs> so if you, sit, if you sit there, I will be there, <laughs> it's good. Uh, and and uh, 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 I think we should start with a very quick round where you respond to, where you have your, a quick reaction to, to, to the report. And we start with, with you, Johanna. Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, I have yes, to put. now it works. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, very happy about this report. I welcome it. I think my biggest takeaway is the uh, the value added of not taking concepts and uh, agendas for granted, but reflecting on what they actually mean, and especially what they mean in a changed development landscape. And I think to make it more complicated, I don't think it's about ownership, of ownership as a part of effective development cooperation, but it's rather about ownership to realize Agenda 2030 and for cooperation. Um, I also like the concept of trust and the importance given to trust. I think the report maybe not fully reflects the, the latest developments in the relationship and, and how the Swedish system or management system is built today. Uh, but I think that's another of the concepts that we need to build in and take forward. Um, I also, I mean, one thought I have to the report is um, it's the whole political reality we work in and what ownership actually means. Um, we have, we've seen a negative political development in very many of our partner countries lately. And uh, of course, working with ownership will have a different meaning in those contexts. And what do we do with it? Uh, uh, that's an issue raised. And the last thing I would like to say is then working for a broad agenda, working for broader partnerships, 
uh, I mean, what partnerships do we want, and what do those? What does that then mean for what kind of ownership we want? I mean, it's, an, it's a discussion we've been having with CEDA lately. Um, I mean, what partnerships we would like CEDA to support, and especially when it comes to capacity strengthening, and of course, uh, what ownership do we see for that? Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. No, yeah. Thank you, Johanna. Now you and, and maybe Leonard, it's your turn now. Okay, I welcome that we bring up the issue on ownership again. I think it's very important to underline that the new context, new times, new context, and it's very important to revisit the whole concept of ownership. Uh, but I want to underline what was stated in, in the uh, policy for global development, that uh, the basis for ownership is that development is something that is taking place in, in a specific uh, context, in a specific country, and the people who are living in that uh, context are the ones who are going to be developed or develop themselves. And they have to be, in, uh, in res be responsible for their own development. So as it is said in the first uh, ever Swedish pol uh, policy for development, uh, Propundra, development should be hel help to self-help. And I think that is very important. I also uh, welcome very much, I, mean, I think this, this uh, picture, which everybody still has in, in your mind, with this uh, uh, balancing of, uh, with, uh, between uh, control and uh, uh, ownership, and, and bit, uh, I mean, this is exactly a, a, a picture that we have to d d deal with. New contexts, new uh, uh, developments, but the basis is that develop is not some, development is not something that a donor is doing. A donor is supporting another uh, people's development. And that is what the concept of ownership means for me. Then, of course, it has to be defined and fresh and revisited again and again. And I welcome again very much this and, discussion. And Stefan, have you? Add something yeah. to the report and Quite. from your German perspective also. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, since uh, I own the report, so it's not so much uh, commenting on the report, but <laughs> maybe to uh, to highlight some aspects which I find uh, most important. Uh, three three po uh, quick points in this regard. Uh, so first of all, I think uh, quality of aid aspects are still highly relevant for a number of partner countries. And this is something what we are forgetting to some extent, let's say, looking at the international debate, I think what we see right now is the post aid effectiveness era, where uh, a lot of momentum uh, is not any longer there. And of course, when it comes to quality of aid, ownership is crucial, is key. Yeah. My, my second point is, um, and um, this is, of course, uh, the core of the report, what uh, Charlotte and Niels were presenting. Uh, the ownership concept today is different from the concept uh, of the past. Yeah? Uh, let me just mention two aspects. One is, um, I think uh, we have today now uh, different challenges when it comes to the implementation of ownership, uh, of development cooperation. Just looking at one main trend is that uh, donors, including Sweden, including Germany, are providing increasingly uh, development corporations through thematic envelopes. So thematic allocation is uh, quite high on the agenda. It might be uh, climate change, it might be migration, it might be another topic. And quite often, it is difficult to find out who is the partner side, who should own our budget for mm. climate change, for, for migration. Mm. Uh, this is something what, we, uh, uh, what wasn't there 10 or 15 years ago. Um, one other aspect is this kind of multi-actor perspective when it comes to um, development cooperation is really an innovation. This is important and quite often we have um, those dilemmata. Let me, let me just uh, uh, mention one concrete example. When we went to Liberia, uh, we, we were thinking about, okay, how to bring in parliament in all those discussions because parliament is always good. Yeah, We assume this, but we found out Parliament in Liberia, this is something what is really difficult. So everything will be really a very heavy process. So to have members of parliament in those processes involved is, is really something what is complicated. My, my last point, thank you for pushing me a bit. Um, my last point is, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should stop here and... Okay, okay, two points. I have many points. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gumbrit. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the report. I think it's excellent. Um, I brought this doll. I'll come back to that one. This one was given to me in September by a lady in Barranca Bermeja, which is a, a city in northeastern Colombia. She is a human rights defender, the lady that gave, gave it, this one to me. And it symbolizes all the women that physically, actually, uh, has made a lot of sacrifices for the, 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 uh, the fight for justice. And this is, this is for me, and I think it's important to have that one on the table. I'll come back maybe to that one later on. That for me is where we need to start the whole discussion about ownership, coming back to what you have said also, Leonard. And it also reflects to a large extent my own shift in l looking at this, my own professional journey from having worked at CEDA as the director for the Africa department with what at that t time remained of the Swedish general budget support, moving over to Guatemala where we have a extremely politicized Swedish development corporation working with change agents in the civil society but also in uh, in the state institutions, looking for change agents, and now working for Diakonia, where we really are looking for these change agents. And I think that, for me, defines a lot about the whole issue of ownership. And that's also why I so much like, um, you say somewhere in your recommendations, or maybe in the summary, that the ownership has to be defined from the rights holders' perspective. And we need to discuss Ownership of what? Is it agenda setting or is it implementation? Because those are two different things. And I think the agenda setting ownership, for me at least now, becomes increasingly important. Um, and, and what we have seen also over time, which makes this difficult, during my time working for CEDA, when we were still fighting for general budget support in Tanzania, uh, Mozambique, uh, we had left already Mali, Burkina Faso and Zambia, was the not only the deterioration of the kind of democratic culture, but also a value shift. We no longer had a common set of values between us and the governments that we were talking about. In Guatemala, when I was working as an ambassador, we saw that extremely clearly, that there was nothing in common between us and the government. So we had to look for other avenues, also looking for state institutions or individuals in state institutions really looking for change. So this, this issue of trust, but also the value shift that we have seen over time, I think is extremely important as we go along. Your body language has me that maybe I've overtaken my time. So I will come back to the risk sharing that you also talk about in this report. And you, might be, you might be aware that we also have a, a recent EBA study on budget support. Yes. Dilemmas that are involved, which we also welcome. I have it on, <laughs> <laughs> but I take it off when I give the floor to to Karin. Yes. No, very briefly. First, from the point of view of of CEDA, where I work, uh, I think I also welcome this report very much because we can clearly see throughout time that ownership has been a, a very prevalent, very important. Um, principle for Swedish aid, and it still remains so. Uh, but I think it has, with this changing context, it has also changed over time. And I think now we, we, we really have to fill the, the concept with a, new, with a new purpose. What does it mean for us uh, working with development cooperation? Uh, I was also in, in Mozambique at the height of the Paris Declaration. I worked on budget support as well. And at that time, it really meant alignment with country systems, use of country systems. It meant giving core support uh, to, to, to governments. It was budget support and program aid to civil society organizations. It was core support. And, uh, and we were very much followed on, on how, we were, how we were doing on these, uh, on these things. That all fell apart, really, because of the shifts in value and because of a lot of things not working. Uh, but it left us with a void. What do we mean by ownership? And I think uh, from CEDA's perspective, we have a new vision as of this year, 
where we say, to be re relevant and sustainable, solutions must always be owned and driven by the actors who are locally rooted in the development context in question. And I think this locally rooted, that development should be driven by local actors is a very important uh, factor. And I think it's very, it's something that we can easily operationalize in, in all these new aspects of de development. E even if we work directly with government, if we work with local <coughs> civil society, if we work with research cooperation, if we work with the multilaterals, we can always make sure that local actors are heard and should be listened to. Even when we do a study like this, there should be local actors, uh, or in a panel like this, if possible, I think. I was say, I tried hard to get one, <laughs> one or two, but it, it, it but takes a lot. Uh, it's something we should keep in mind and try to pursue mm, yes. in, in all aspects of, of our work. Thank you. Yeah, I think this leads us easily to you again, Johanna. Okay. Yeah, because uh, this, uh, that we, yeah, the, we, we have seen that this, the state-to-state -state cooperation has, all, has decreased very much, and I think you said it was 13% now, so it's, it's not much left of it. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, we know that there are states that need re read to, the fragile states, they really need to be strengthened. How can that be done? Uh, and and uh, because I think it was it, the, minister, you know, the minister or the policy level, uh, as I in the, in the budget support report, I, I think it was quite clear that donors, you cannot meet all objectives with one measure. <laughs> So, but when it became problems with, with uh, human rights and so on, then it, you, we abandoned something that actually worked in, 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 in many ways. But how, how, what is your discussion now in the ministry on how to promote institution building in fragile state and ownership in, in fragile states? Um, I think a few aspects. I think when it comes to working with fragile states, uh, Sweden has done a lot. Sweden and the government has done a lot when it comes to uh, the peace and state building goals and how to actually promote effective development cooperation in these settings. Uh, we've also been leading the international dialogue on how to undertake development in these settings. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, I mean, that's an overarching framework which is present. Uh, we also now have guidelines for development strategies since a year back. Uh, what we've tried to do is to emphasize flexibility, adaptability, uh, to have a development based on the local context, and, and to really provide a wide frame and to have long-term development results in order to be able to adapt implementation to the local context and, and to be very agile in that setting. Um, so I think the, that's a good basis. Um, for that, uh, and that's a very clear signal from the government, and it also relates to how the government sees risk, and it's very clear from the guidelines that we need to manage and see risk uh, of entering contributions against the risk of, um, of, of not achieving development outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really the backbone, and that's mm -hmm. the risk we have to take and that we have to consider, and then to manage those risks. Um, I also, like uh, Jörg said, I also believe we shouldn't see states as one actor. Uh, state, working with a state entails very much. You have change agents within the state. You can work state on a, 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 on a national level. You have the technical assistance. We work with the local governments, etc. Uh, so I think it's very much about identifying uh, where are the positive forces and then having the strength, you know, having the insurance that this is what we need to do and entering, and then being prepared to adapt as development goes along. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And of course, maybe, I mean, something about how we work, I mean, we talk, I mean, the report talks a lot about intermediaries. I think working both with the EU and providing budget support in these contexts, and also working with the UN, and thereby, it's also a possibility of working in these settings and a very good uh, possibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and mm, Lennart, uh, I think uh, this working working in, in different circumstances and, and, and promoting the development goals and promoting ownership, uh, uh, you have been talking a lot about dialogue and what can be achieved by dialogue. We see negative developments and, and sometimes then we just go to the civil society and, and, and abandon the state, and, and what, what, but what can be done with the state? 
Yeah, we have a, a shared example, Tanzania. What should we do with Tanzania <laughs> right, right now? As the report uh, very clearly states, that the world is very complicated today. We have increased authoritarianism, uh, we have a shrinking space for civil society. And at the same time, also on the, the recipient side, uh, fewer we have fewer like-minded countries, actually very few like-minded countries in a number of areas I mean, where we have very strong values we want to drive. I mean, the government, Swedish government has set a number of very uh, strict uh, rules for uh, that Sweden should be f for in the, on the edge on a number of very important issues. So the question is, how should we as a rather alone uh, donor uh, respond in in countries where where the space is shrinking for for uh, for uh, a lot of important uh, value loaded uh, questions and uh, in my personal view and this is very personal view is that there is i mean ownership means that we are engaged in supporting the people and the country mm -hmm. in their development and we this doesn't mean that we are looking away from our own values. We, they are very important. And so we have, we show our relationship. For example, Tanzania, we have a 50 years long relationship, friendship, uh, and, and uh, quite good rela uh, relations on all levels, from university level to, to, to local level. And I think it is, an, uh, we, we have... Uh, a very good opportunity, even in difficult times, to be, first of all, present. It's very important to be present when things are getting worse. And, and secondly, also to keep up a dialogue. And this dialogue has to be a very careful dialogue. We have to have a, a strategy for how this di di dialogue should be implemented. And I think we have a role. I, we, I just have a colleague in the research community who came back from Tanzania. He has done 50, 20 years of re research on dem democracy in Tanzania. And he sees there are a lot of very important areas where we can make uh, uh, important uh, contributions, even in this present situation. And hopefully, uh, participate in, in, in a change towards an improvement when it comes to to uh, oppressive uh, regimes. Mm -hmm. And maybe there are some institutions that, that can, uh, like in the United States, maintain the system or, or keep, it, keep it at least surviving in one way or the other. Now, Jeor, uh, uh, and I will come back to the two of you, and you can also ask for the floor and, 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 and uh, comment what, what the others have been saying, but I have two important questions for the two of you. But Jeor first. We talked now about the shrinking space for civil society. And, 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 and that's a lot of talk about that. Uh, but to you, I would also like to, to note that there's also sometimes uh, 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 the state is, has also, there's shrinking, shrinking room for them. <laughs> uh, and they're crowded out sometimes with funding for the civil society. And, 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 uh, 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 and, and we really also need, as Rothstein, maybe not the perfect state, but the good enough state mm. uh, for, to, to maintain some stability. Do you see any risk for crowding out public institutions when donors more and more bypass past the state and channel funds through local inter and international NGOs? You have been an implementer for CEDA Diakonia in many instances, and also you run your own programs uh, and uh, working in fragile state. Do you see sort of how how this can gradually lead to not to a frag more fragmented society, but to a more coherent society where mm -hmm. NGOs have their proper role, mm -hmm. not as a uh, yeah, as a semi government? Exactly, and that. Uh, w w we Diakonia, we have uh, 17 or 18 bilateral contracts with Swedish embassies around the world uh, in Africa, Amer Latin America and Asia. Uh, and our contribution there is exactly what you say, to play a complementary role uh, to what the Swedish Development Cooperation Strategy is trying to do with civil society but also with state governments. I really do see this risk of crowding out. Um, we now. Recently, we have heard uh, in the Swedish public media and in the uh, debate uh, calls for cutting aid to Tanzania. We have heard calls to cut aid to Palestine, uh, to Cambodia. And I think that these calls are um, 
simplistic in a way because we we need just as uh, as Leonard say we need to stay. We see the extremely dramatic development going on right now in Nicaragua, where they were abandoned by the uh, uh, development cooperation community. And look what happened with the state of Nicaragua. It was co-opted totally. So I think that there is a risk if we pull back, and also a risk if we divert all our funds through intermediaries such as the United Nations, uh, or going only with the civil society. We really need to combine the two. Um, and coming back to, to the doll and coming back to Colombia, uh, the situation in, as you know, many of you uh, in Colombia is the fact that the state is, uh, has abandoned a large part of the country. It's simply not present. Uh, what that lady needs is rule of law. And for rule of law to be uphold, you need institutions. So I think that we need at least to be able to stay behind or stay around supporting institutions that uphold rule of law. And that can not be done only through the UN system or with civil society. You need to work closely with, with institutions that carry on and uphold the, the rule of law of this country. So, so I, I really do think that there is this risk and that we, uh, we also from civil society must be aware of of really looking for this balancing between state actors and, and civil society. And hold the state responsible. And hold the state responsible. Yeah. Ask them to be responsible. Yeah, and Corinne, uh, he, he mentioned now also the, the, the role of intermediaries, the civil society and also the international organization. I like a vision very much that, that it should start with the local context. And, 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 and it's actually almost a quote of a sentence in this report that it's the, the yeah, the, 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 the Problems should be locally defined and, 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 and solutions found and, and things out. So it's, I haven't got it now. But uh, how do you accomplish that when you channel more and more funds through, through the various intermediaries? If you take the climate program, for instance, it's a long, 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 long list of, 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 of recipients that, that channel the money. Will they, will they fall, how can you make them? Carry on, your principles, follow your principles. I, maybe I can come back to your question, but I wanted to comment also on, on, your, on your intervention. I think it's interesting that we hear uh, this demand on the state to be able to respond to, to rights bearers and to be able to deliver services. We hear that increasingly from civil society organizations, not least in Sweden, that there has to be uh, governments responsible and being able to deliver. Uh, and I think I work a lot on with actual central governments and I work with uh, Swedish authorities sometimes. And I think what the Swedish authorities try to bring in is some of these rule, rule of law principles and some of these uh, benefits of working with in a participatory way. We have a, we have a system in Sweden which is open and transparent, uh, but we can also, sh I, I, I don't mean to say that we can export the system, far from it, but we can show that there is a benefit of having openness, listening to uh, respondents. And I, I sometimes want to think of uh, the role of development cooperation as being that bridge between different groups and to the way possible try to add some weight to those who aren't heard. So that if we can add some weight to the poor, people living in poverty and depression, but by working with, with a variety of stakeholders. So I think we need to, to look at this in a very shared uh, way, the way you describe also in the report, shared ownership. Uh, how we can work with different actors, coming back to your questions now. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person to respond to, the, to this. We, are, we know that we in increasingly channel a lot of funds through the UN. I think the report points out that there isn't um, a clear guidance uh, as of yet on how we can promote ownership in all these very intermediate chains and levels. I think what I mentioned in the beginning, trying to think local actors, empowering local actors within all those chains, chains would be a good start. When, can we think of, uh, I see my colleagues here, for example, working on, on research, and there's increasingly a lot of research funds 
channeled uh, at international level that goes most, even on development, goes mostly to uh, Western uh, universities, even if it's on development. Can we, as they uh, often do, push for having local researchers, national researchers in those contexts at all level? Uh, that's, that's one way, and I think we could systematize it uh, a lot more in, at all levels. Could I just add something to that? Because I think, uh, I mean, a very high priority for the government has been UN reform and how to implement UN reform, which is very much ongoing. And that's very much about increasing effectiveness and ownership of the UN system and bringing a normative agenda uh, to the local level on the one hand and making it more country adaptable with a resident coordinator, with finance dialogues, with an UNDEF system and a resident coordinator. So I think there's a lot of work going on. It's not there, but that's contributing to uh, creating the linkages between the global and the local. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, to you, Stefan. I have to remember this one. Yeah, Stefan. Uh, uh, yes, uh, do you think there is, it, there is hope for for re-establishing uh, ownership as a central uh, uh, principle in development cooperation in the world today. And, and how can it be taken from here? How can you promote it using, from, from the point of view of this report, but also how can it be used? Okay. Yes, there is hope. Um, my hope is that, um, or how to pick it up, um, I think one aspect is, and this uh, we discussed it already, is that um, in, in, uh, in terms of Swedish development cooperation, you can try to build it in your own approach. Yeah, um, For example, when it comes to um, uh, your support for the United Nations in Liberia. But the second one is to bring it back um, to the international agenda. And mm -hmm. I think this is really a very important aspect that uh, Sweden can really try to push this agenda. And I think we have several platforms in this regard uh, which might be uh, uh, crucial. One is the OECD with the Development Assistance Committee. Uh, this is a club, um, uh, but still a very important club in uh, defining quality standards, criteria for OECD donors mm -hmm. and uh, to bring this uh, agenda uh, uh, to a larger extent back to the OECD would be one, one central aspect. A second um, uh, aspect is our second platform, United Nations, of course. We have the Development Cooperation Forum, which might play a role in this regard, but uh, maybe even more important is that um, um, the high-level political forum is the main mechanism to, uh, for the implementation of the Agenda 2030. Next year, in 2019, we have a milestone, uh, because five years after the adoption of, of this agenda, and one, one concrete activity could be that um, Sweden would, um, uh, would uh, um, uh, uh, organize an event, side event, just on this topic, yeah? how, to, how to make sure that ownership is really part of development cooperation programs. So HLPF might be a good uh, point for Swedish uh, government um, to, to push this agenda on the international level. Yes, thank you very much. And Johanna and Corin. <laughs> in, in organizing this seminar, I was actually suggesting we need to have some voices from the South, voices that, 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 that uh, have views on this agenda that have participated. There used to be such voices when the Paris Declaration came and before, after the structural adjustment programs in Africa, when we had Coalition for Africa and all that, there were many, many uh, good spokesperson from, from the South. But what, do you hear them now? Uh, Johanna, when you go to the international meeting, how, what, what is, is there a, of course, they must, they are allowed to be as confused as we are, but are there high voices? I, I think, I mean, the last big meeting, I w with Verena, we went to one meeting earlier this spring, but then the last big high-level meeting was Nairobi, and I think the big takeaway from there is that we were not there, uh, but they were there, mm -hmm. to some extent, because there's a lack of political engagement when it comes to discussing uh, effective development cooperation on a global level. Uh, personally, I believe it's very much because it's perceived as a technical issue and not a political issue. Uh, but that was very sad. I mean, our, the Swedish minister was one of three ministers from the, I mean, f from the west or from the north or, or, or whatever. Uh, so that's, uh, that was very sad. I, I think another issue is 
um, who who I mean who is the global south I mean mm. or, or who actually participates mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, weaknesses of the aid effectiveness is that we have not been able to make it interesting for uh, what are not not new any donors. longer the new emerging donors yeah. uh, they do not they don't find it interesting and I think therefore personally I don't think the OC DAC is the right platform because it's very much connected to an aid platform rather than a um, uh, well as compared to the UN um, so that's a challenge I think a new set I think definitely there's a need for a new setting uh, I don't even know if it's the UN but I think we do need a discussion on where how to form that and what it should actually include. Um, and having said that, I also believe in that the most important discussion will take place on a country level because that's where we actually achieve the results for people living in poverty and under oppression. So it's about uh, ensuring a setup and making, not having too high demands, but actually having a framework and a basis for discussion that makes sense for people who are actually directly affected by it. Mm -hmm. and are supposed to be affected by all the sustainable development goals, so yes. it, it, it goes up. Uh, Stefan? Yeah. Maybe just to, to add on, on, on this, I, I think we shouldn't think about one exclusive mandate to have this discussion. So, uh, DAC OECD is, is one forum, one platform, another one is, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to uh, um, to hear that uh, you mentioned it, um, uh, the global uh, GPDC, Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, the last high-level meeting was, was in Nairobi. And I think uh, one strong advantage when it comes to the GPDC is that uh, recipient countries, partner countries are around the table. One main group of countries missing in this uh, uh, forum is a group of rising powers providing South-South cooperation. So this is, this is missing, but uh, at least we have uh, uh, recipient countries mm -hmm. and OECD countries uh, discussing those topics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be one other appropriate uh, platform, I think. Yeah. yeah, there seems to be many country groups that should be mobilized, should mobilized with, to take an interest in this. So we can start on our side with, with OECD. Uh, Georg, and now we, I think we are approaching a final round now for you in the panel, because we'll open the floor for, 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 for the audience. But so you can make quick comments now, Georg. Mm -hmm. Thank you. On, on the voice giving, not voice giving, but the listening thing, thank you for, for, for bringing that, that up going. But I think, I think it's important to, disc to, to, to also ask the question, to whom are we listening? Uh, if we look at, uh, and I'm a newcomer back into civil society again, but when I listen around, there is, of course, still uh, Global South civil society networks that work vis-a-vis -vis the, the OECD in Paris and so on, and, and New York, etc. But what we do see is a, a new kind of mobilization in the countries that is more issue-based and in, under new forms of mobilization. And when we talk about ownership, we need also to understand this kind of mobilization. And, and, and I think that we, um, and among these groups that are new, of course, we have youth groups that, that we, it's even more difficult to really understand who they are and how they operate and how we can relate to them. So I think it's important also, and just before finishing, um, we might have had a situation when I was working with this some 10, 15 years ago, that we could sit in a meeting, government representatives with South government representatives, and in their delegations there would be civil society representation. Today, in many countries, the, um, the distance between government and civil society is increasing. So it's no longer possible for them to relate to governments in the South. So they have to find other avenues to make their voices heard. So I think that also complicates the thing of listening to the Global South. Mm -hmm. okay. Corin? Is this the final yeah, round? Yeah, then? we'll see. No, you're, you're, maybe I, after. I, I think I'd, I think I'd like to say something about capacity development and, and what the new agenda means for that. And I think uh, you, are, you have very good recommendations in the report uh, that, that if you start from uh, locally defined uh, problems that mean something, that, that are owned by local actors, and you start working from locally defined problems 
uh, you, Im you immediately have a different approach to capacity development because you have to, you don't have the solution, you don't import external solutions, you instead try to see how can this be managed, how can it be done, you experiment, you try, you iterate and you adapt, you take solutions maybe from the global south, maybe from uh, a neighboring country, maybe from the next village. Uh, so that concept of capacity development where it's not something about knowledge transfer or no. somebody imposing is, is an important concept and uh, for ownership. As a former uh, OECD ambassador, I'm so pleased uh, with, with peer learning. Exactly, it's mm. peer learning in, in this, and we are actually working with OECD to, to, to develop mm. this. But I think it's, it's, it's important that we also uh, use that knowledge uh, about local, local problem solving mm. as a way of capacity development. And that, for us as donors, means that we need to be better at adaptive management. Uh, development can't be planned very rigidly in advance. We cannot uh, assume that we know what the results are going to be and we have to be cool with that. We have to admit that that's Adapt. the mm. fact and we have to, so we have to be better at adaptive management. I think we have gone, qu made quite a lot of progress at CEDA on this and I would like to see other uh, donors actually joining uh, or a lot of donors are trying to do this, uh, do development differently. Uh, but, but that's definitely a concept that we would like to mm -hmm. uh, see linked to capacity development. Thank you, Karin. It's clearly a lot of things to discuss with others. Mm. Uh, not. First on your point, uh, are there resources available in the third world? Yes. Mm -hmm. I was in a seminar on a Nordic Africa Institute arranged in, in uh, Accra in uh, West Africa and on these issues exactly on ownership and capacity building and there is a new research community with young uh, very active and engaged researchers. So yes there is, uh, there is uh, not only in the civil society but also in the research community and the community at large. Secondly, I want to, under, to underline that what, uh, what uh, Karl Metella said. I mean, capacity building is, a ba is sort of the basis of all, also for ownership. I mean, ownership is built on by knowledge development, capacity development in, in, in the countries. So it's extremely, they are inter very much interconnected. And here we come also to the, you, you mentioned we have to be flexible, we have to work very differently in different countries to find where uh, a good support, also on government level, can, can go for This requires capacity also on our side. <laughs> it requires very uh, ability to, for, for, for uh, analysis and it requires capacity on our side. So I, I think that it's not only capacity. I mean, capacity building is a basis in the developing countries, but also we have to increase our capacity to be able to, to, to run this. Uh, very difficult uh, job. Thank you very much. We are actually on time. <laughs> uh, and, and so we can actually, we have some time now for questions from the floor. And I think we have a tall guy here who will help you with the microphones. Uh, Jan. Jan will help you with that. He's a, he's a trainee at, at uh, IBA. Or do, what do you call it? You call it? Inter intern. 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 Intern at IBA. Mm -hmm. Yes? A question over there or a comment? <coughs> And state should your I, name also. Should I stand? Uh, my name is Mikael Bostrom and I'm uh, from CEDA and I recently returned from, from Rwanda after three years as, as Head of Development Cooperation uh, in Kigali, at the Swedish Embassy in Kigali. So I have a, a comment on, on Rwanda which might yeah, put some... some, some, some focus on some of the, of the aspects which have been, been discussed. Um, I concur with, with most of what is said and, and stated the, in, the, in the chapter or, or section on Rwanda in the, in the report, but I'm not really, I don't really agree with, with the statement that Sweden works around government in Rwanda, and that was also shown on, on the screen. Um, I, it's not entirely correct. Even though we we focus a lot on on support of civil society in, in Rwanda, uh, 
around 40% of our total annual budget goes to uh, um, government institutions, um, uh, including the University of Rwanda, which is a, is a state university, which is also discussed and mentioned in, in the report. Uh, we work directly with the Ministry of uh, Labour on the National Employment Programme, on the Ministry of Environment, on two programmes, a capacity building programme and also uh, support to the Green Fund, uh, the Environment Fund of Rwanda. Um, so we work, we, we are combining the two to, to refer to what, what Jero was saying. We are working both with, with government and the civil society in, in, in the country. Because we think that to relate to ownership, both need to, 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 to own the development of the country, both state and civil society actors. Um, but it's not, it, it, it's not easy in Rwanda, because we are in Rwanda, we're working with the government with very high ambitions and very strong will to control not only what government institutions do, of course, but also what civil society does, mm -hmm. and not least what uh, the donors support civil society to do. So, um, um, but we are trying to, to co combine the two and, and work with both and get both to own the development of the country. We'll see. We'll see what happens at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, I have some, uh, anyway, a, a I, will, I will send some comments to, to the authors, I think. Yeah, that's good. Oh, that's good. But I think I, I, some, I, I yeah. you agree with Some Gio other corrections on the, on the chapter. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. I will yes. send it in writing. Yes, and, and you here. I should know the name and I know, but you know, I'm getting old. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Stefan Dahlgren. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'm a little bit curious about what, how the panel looks at, uh, would say about the SDGs as a kind of vehicle for ownership. I mean, it's globally um, accepted, is even enthusiastically uh, embraced by, by partner countries. And I've also seen how it works in the emerging, very rapidly emerging community of evaluators from partner countries where this is a kind of common uh, base for, for discussions. So do you think that the SDGs are, are important in, in this respect to kind of feeling of ownership uh, in a kind of indirect way? Thank you. Who would like to address that? Could there actually be a vehicle for a more equal relationship? I think it's, it's in a way that you put it. Georg? is eager to respond to that, and maybe this is a good question for all of you. Thank you, but Stefan. I would, uh, I would try to be very, very quick. Uh, more or less recently, having coming back from Guatemala. Guatemala is a small, corrupt state with a politically economic elite that is running the country uh, and not in the interest of the population. And it's a high performer on the, on the, on the SDGs. They do public statements, they deliver reports, they engage <laughs> strongly, but there's no implementation. So I think that, that it's, it doesn't really filter down to changes on national policy making on the ground. If there is no state to deliver on, if there is no political will to translate your global commitment to the SDG, nothing will happen on the ground. On the other hand, this is an opportunity that Sweden, I hope, still uses to push, the, in, in this case, Guatemalan government to say, okay, fine, you go to New York, this is what you say, this is what we expect from you on the ground, because we have a joint commitment here on the SDGs. So it is a potential, but it's used, at least in Guatemala, as an excuse not to do things. I think if that's a, a really good, how to translate these global fantastic goals into social engineering. Hmm? That is what we have been trying. Uh, Corinne? and Stefan on this. I wanted, um, uh, yes, uh, no, I wanted to state yes on your question. I think yes, the SDGs is a fantastic uh, instrument and vehicle for shared ownership and mutual accountability. Uh, and I think we should really use it. Uh, so 
but of course it takes a lot of effort to do it. But what I think it's also very useful for is uh, for coherence and, and looking at ourselves. What should we do? Uh, because this is uh, the policy for global development at global scale. And there should be more instruments to actually ask for accountability on us. What are we doing uh, to implement the SDGs and to change our behavior? So that's an, another very potential and powerful instrument. Mm -hmm. Stefan? Just to add on, on this, I think one of the most innovative aspects when it comes to the SDGs, the SDG 17, is especially this aspect of multi-actor partnerships. So this is really based in, in uh, SDG 17. And one concrete uh, uh, way how to use it is um, the um, uh, high-level political forum where uh, the volunteer national reports are presented. Mm -hmm. And one way how to present it, and this is very much in line with what you are saying, is jointly with civil society, with the private sector, etc., etc. <laughs> Some countries are using it as a nice roadshow to present um, this is really the best place to go for touristic reasons. Some countries are using it as a very serious exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe just briefly on, on Rwanda, thank you so much for, for, for the indication that um, your view is a bit uh, different. We had already uh, during the coffee break uh, a brief discussion. I think um, um, there are several ways how to read uh, CEDAR's program in Rwanda. And I think um, um, uh, one aspect why Sweden is supporting so much academic institutions, especially University of Rwanda, um, is, is of course that um, this is seen as an uh, additional actor in Rwanda and that Sweden would like to support this additional actor. And I think there's nothing wrong with it, but I uh, would see it really as a specific uh, 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 setting uh, in, in this regard. So um, please uh, let us know uh, any additional comment, um, but there are also different perspectives, I think, how to read the program. Thank you. We have one more ask for the floor here. And your name? Your, you. Then I think we are approaching Thank you. the end. Uh, yeah. My name is Patrick Storgan. Uh, one question to the authors. Um, and and um, it's about your, your conclusion when you've written this report. If you, going back, looking at where you came from with your terms of reference, do you think that the whole concept of ownership, is it a useful one? Is it something that really brings value to, to us as whatever we want to call ourselves, <laughs> development workers of, of one sort or another? I think it's very clear from the discussions here today that it's, it's one of these catch-all uh, concepts. It's, it's been clear here that it can mean basically anything good for everybody. It's everybody's definition of what's good when it comes to how to implement development practices on the one hand side uh, and then it brings up all these other questions on on stakeholders and so forth uh, do you feel that there's this maybe the biggest conclusion here should be around how to redefine our concept tools our toolbox so that we can be a bit more specific when we talk about management uh, ideas and and innovations and cooperations and co-creation within this, this context. That's my first question. The oh. second question is that <laughs> there's no one here talking about the private sector uh, in a real sense. And there's no one on the panel representing uh, the private sector. Civil society, NICE, uh, uh, development, cooperation institutions, research. But uh, the biggest actor when it comes to development is the private sector. Uh, that's where the capital is that can actually spur some of the, the changes that we, uh, that we need to see. We all know this. Uh, what does the ownership concept, whatever it is, mean to uh, from a private sector perspective? Thank you. It's it's there in the report, and and it has been mentioned. But but a, a quick answer to this, because this opens a whole new. Yeah, but you see, we we will soon have to wind up. But I have you, I have you there, private sector also union to union. Uh, so you can come in now and well, then we, we, we... I wouldn't we, say that the trade union development corporation solidarity organization is uh, part uh, of the private sector, but of course the private sector is also uh, um, showing us that it's a, it's a global... and the globalization is not very well covered so far in the debate. And I think that when we come to country-specific uh, ownership, that is also one thing, but we know that globalization pushes us to work 
in a global manner, and then ownership is put to, to question much more. And I would like to hear from the panel a little bit, little bit more on the program. Uh, um, how can I say, when you, when, you wor when you work with global programs, how can you, in global programs, assure that there is a, glo a, a local ownership? Sorry, I'm Sigrid Bergfeldt from Union Union, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, and are there more questions now? Otherwise, I give the floor to the panel. Yeah, you have been there with the hand for a long time. So, you have the chance. Louise Higard from the International Foundation for Science. This is mostly a question to Karin. You mentioned before the importance of local defi definitions of challenges and problems. Could you explain a little bit further how CEDA is working with this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I think, thank you. I think there would be many, many more questions from the floor if we could continue, but, but we will not have time with that. But I should give you the chance to quick responses to this, for instance, the one on, on how do we actually work, I think you answered that before, how should we work with the, with the global program in order to s make them see the ground? Yeah, for instance? I think there were two questions. The, the one on how to work with global actors, uh, I, I tried to answer before, and I think it's really about trying to involve local actors at all levels, asking for it. Are they represented? Are they heard? So on. Uh, on the other question, uh, how, how we are working to bring in local solution, this is, as I mentioned, it's in our vision. Uh, CEDA has a new vision and mission statement. Uh, and, it's, it's, and so we, in our programming for next year, we were all asked to think, how can we promote local solutions and innovation? It actually came together, local solutions and innovation. And I think it has shown that if, if you are close to the problem that should be solved, then you are also more prone to find new solutions, solutions that work. Uh, so it's again about bringing in the actors that are the frontline workers, that are the ones who actually know how, how things are working. Uh, so, and, and for us, I think it means very much uh, being adaptive, being able to, to adapt to, to different circumstances. It's something that we struggle with, and it's something that I think we should be uh, measured on as well, because our systems are a bit uh, rigid, to be honest. But uh, we definitely have the, the, the leadership and, and the mandate to, to be better on this. Mm -hmm. And maybe a quick, a quick last word from, from you, and then it's my turn. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, all of you, if you, if okay. you like, but yeah. be quick. Yeah, thank you for, for those additional questions and comments. Yes, we as a team of authors, we think this is still a useful concept, but it's a different concept from, from the past. Uh, this is why we introduced this term balanced ownership, because we think uh, that we need to consider several aspects, um, the dilemmata, what we are discussing in the report, and we need to break it down to make it more, more concrete. So it's a conceptual debate, but in a way we need to bring it down to uh, uh, specific decisions about allocation of resources, how to deal with it when it comes to vertical funds, to global funds, etc., etc. Just briefly on, on the private sector, um, when we are talking about uh, uh, multi-actor uh, uh, ownership, mm -hmm. of course, private sector is part of it. And uh, my example on the voluntary national reports for the uh, high-level political forum, of course, the private actor should be present in this regard. When it comes to national platforms for discussions on development cooperation, of course, it's civil society plus other actors, including private sector. So private sector is, of course, uh, 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 a key partner in this regard. Mm -hmm. Um, a final word? Yeah, mm. final word. I, I, would, I th thank you for the report and thank you, Eva, for organizing this. Um, I think, I mean, I come back to where I started. It's extremely valuable to go behind the concepts and the various dimensions and see what, to make conscious decisions, really, when we come to implementation. Uh, from the ministry side, we have, I look forward to discussions with CEDA and we concord in the beginning of the spring on how to take it forward, basically, mm -hmm. and the private sector in that. Perfect. You want to, yeah? yeah. Patrick, you can discuss the, 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 the ownership as a uh, idea, but behind ownership is something concrete. 
And uh, you can see it when it doesn't function in reality. I mean, if you went out during the 80s in, in different eight, uh, African states and saw how donors acted by taking over the responsibility, not only on project level, but also on policy level. Economic reform, democratic reform was run by outside. That, of course, did not have any sustainability built into it. So there is a difference. I mean, you have to start where development starts. Development takes place in a specific setting with specific people. And these are the ones who are actually driving the development forward. And ownership means that you should allow those who are responsible for their own development to, to drive their development. Of course, I mean, you have to take uh, uh, account of context, you have to take uh, account of changing uh, times, which we have talked about all the time. But behind the, con the concept context, uh, ownership, there is a reality, and you can see it if it doesn't function. And if you, don't, if you want to read uh, about this, there is a Norwegian history of, of uh, uh, aid, 1,500 pages in three volumes, which brings up for 50 years how non-ownership has worked. Mm -hmm. And every new evaluation has uh, pointed that, uh, Thank the fact you, that it didn't work. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's his birthday, so maybe he has the privilege of talking a bit more. Um, I will be very quick a bit yeah. uh, before handing over. I think it... Going back to the policy for global development, the Swedish policy for global development that actually turned 15 on Sunday, last Sunday, 15 years since it was uh, taken by government. And we have one of the two authors of an excellent piece of paper uh, on, um, about this. So please go to the web and, and look for, for that. The policy for global development, the strength with that policy is the two perspectives. The listening perspective, the perspective of the people living under poverty and oppression, and the rights perspective. We tend to forget the rights perspective. And I think it's important to come back to another aspect of this, and I think we have hardly touched upon it. This is a political project. We, have to, we tend to treat it as a technical project, but ownership is a political project. And the reason we have so big problems with it now is also that the, the, the lack of trust, the, the, the value shift, and the lack of respect for rules, for national rules, rule of law, but also international rules makes it so difficult to really, really advocate for ownership. So it's a political project. I think it's important to, to remember that. We have a daunting task. <laughs> we do. <laughs> and, but I, and I want to thank you sincerely uh, in the panel and, 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 and for the presentations and for all the, those who have been working on this report. And I should also mention here that we have a few of the reference group members here. Uh, you want? Uh, oh, sorry, Fjellner. You are Kim. You are Kim Molander. <laughs> and and Janne said again. Is there anyone else here that was in the reference group? You have also contributed very much to this. And we have Lena, uh, Johansson de Schotto in, in, in the Secretariat that have been also uh, coaching this. Mm. Uh, and and uh, I think we have had a, a rich discussion and good presentations today. And I think that we all agree, or in agreement, that ownership deserves to stay as a guiding principle in development cooperation. I also think that the study has captured that the concept is neither easily understood nor easily applied in today's development cooperation. In the early days of development cooperation, it was about transfer of resources from rich countries organized in the OECD to the many very poor countries at the time. La Chanel, who last year wrote an essay for EBA, compared now and then through numbers. 1% of the rich countries' GDP then corresponded to 3% of GDP of countries, uh, uh, of, of GDP of, of, of countries in need, and up to 30% of their budgets. Taught, today, fewer countries are eligible for ODA because they have grown economically and advanced in many other ways. Some have become uh, donors. If these countries were to allocate 1% of their GDP as ODA today, it would co correspond to 20% of the two poorer countries' uh, GDP and cover their total budget needs. But development cooperation today is less and less about transfer of resources targeting the poor. Even given the present o OECD ODA figure, which is 35% or how much is it of GDP that is ODA, 
35, yeah, something. It has stayed there for a long time. There is plenty of money around uh, from a historic perspective. That aid budget, what aid budgets are doing today is to maintain, now I come with my own perspective and an additional perspective, and it's not an E by view, it's my reflections. You have to bear with that. Uh, I, uh, uh, but what aid budgets are doing today is to maintain and expand a huge overarching system of international organizations, of national and regional actors, establishing norms, they're doing a lot of good things, uh, defining good policies and back practices. They promote peer learning and some little action also. I do not know if anyone can tell how much of what is going on under the label development cooperation today hits the ground in poor countries. I am not talking about humanitarian assistance here because I think that's a chapter, a chapter of its own that we are also studying. But we can perhaps think of a system uh, as a, of the system as we have it today, as a global public sector producing uh, policies and global public goods. Implementing the sustainable development goals. And that cannot be allowed, and that cannot be allowed to be a domain of financiers only. That system, with all its multilateral organization and specialized and vertical funds, must also be owned by all stakeholders and right holders. The poorest of them need to be empowered in order to have a chance to contribute and to benefit. That can still, uh, that, that can still be a transfer role for development aid. We should at least be able jointly to make sure that all children, also in the weakest states, get education, health services and food, that they can develop their capacity, their capacity as active citizens. Maybe we can also nourish trust and ownership through institution building for, for, for serving, for producing these basic needs. I think we need to think about development cooperation as something that a global public state uh, sector is doing and we should be doing it today because we are one global world. But then there should also be some element of it where we really care for the possibility for the poorest to participate and, and be part of the government of the system, to be owners of the system. Yeah. So that is my conclusion and I think we have a lot of work ahead. Thank you very much.